Hello and welcome to part 10 of my George Thomas dividing head build. If you haven't seen the other 9 parts and you wish to do so, the series so far is in a playlist over on my channel. I'll put a link in the description. In this part I'm going to finish these sector arms. They need a retaining nut to thread on here that will have a register to take the fingers themselves and a spring to hold them against accidental rotation. Additionally, they both need a ball knob for the ends and they also need a clamp to hold them at the chosen spacing. I'm going to start with the nut and the spring, so let's move over to the lathe and make a start. The nut is a simple piece of turning, and all of the features can be completed at one setting, so there are no concentricity worries. The large diameter is specified at the supplied stock dimension, so after a facing cut, I can jump right in and add the knurl. When doing this, I prefer to have a straight knurl on items that are to be rotated only, and a diamond knurl for parts that are to be pulled although I'm sure it makes no difference at all. When it comes to surface finish, I find that there is always a witness mark both where the tool starts and where it finishes. So after setting the tool depth some distance from where I want my final surface, I'm feeding under power until I am past it. I will then be able to turn away any unsightly marks and be left with as clean a knurl as I can get. In terms of feed, I always use the slowest power feed available and the results usually come out just fine. With the knurling done, I can move on to the register for the fingers. I am yet again using the carriage stop to set the shoulder position with an extra tenth hour or so to allow final facing to length when finished. And then we have a simple turning job to take it down to a thou or two below 0.950. This should be the final pass and I have a nice running fit on the sector fingers. So we can move on to the boring. As always, I am opening out with a pilot drill followed by the largest one that I have below my target dimension. And then switching to a boring bar to bring to the final size for threading. This piece of material in the chuck is also going to become the graduated dial for the micro adjuster, so I cannot simply bore all the way through it. Of course the sensible thing to do here would be to make the dial first and put it to one side for later. Instead what I'm going to do is bore and thread a blind hole purely to put off thinking about that dial. With the hole 2 dimension, I can bring my tool up against the carriage stop and create a reference mark on the outside of the part, just to give me a visual of what's going on inside. I can then use this to judge the dimensions of the internal runoff groove, and with that complete and transferred to the outside of the part, setting the carriage stop for the threading tool becomes trivial. I'm aiming for a close-ish fit on the spindle, so once I'm within a thou or two of book depth, I'm trial fitting the part each pass. As soon as I feel it begin to thread on, a couple of spring passes bring it to size. Facing to final length, a couple of chamfers and a countersink, and I can part this off. With the part reverse in the chuck, it can be faced to final dimension. Another chamfer and countersink, and this part is done. I have this trial assembled, and the sectors are a nice fit on that nut. What we now need is a spring to fit in here to hold them from accidental rotation. The material supplied for this is 1 16th music wire, and I'm going to try and simply bend this by hand over a round bar in the vise. I have one end secured in a drilled hole, and I'm just pulling the wire around the former with pliers. Now I have no idea how much spring back to expect when doing this, so I'm just reducing the former in stages until I'm somewhere near the correct size. Trimming off the excess and putting a kink in the spring using the vise, and it's good enough. Off camera, I have just touched the ends of the stone to remove the worst of the sharp edges, and it fits sort of reasonably on the nut. I hope you can see that putting a kink in rather than the usual helix means I will have a smoother contact with the sector fingers. That's the idea anyway. Let's see if it works. That is actually a surprisingly pleasing action, so despite the part looking awful, it will certainly do for now. To finish these off, we need the ball handles and locking screw, and this arm needs to have a step bent into it to bring it down to the surface of the plate. I'll attempt the ball handles first, so it's back to the lathe. Both the supplied stock and the specified ball dimension are a quarter inch, so to allow me to take a full cut and remain at size, I'm starting with some 5 16 bar from my shelf. Although if you wanted to use the supplied material, I'm sure a few thou undersize would make no difference at all. After facing both ends, I'm starting by turning down to 0.26 and then creating the runoff for the ball with a round nose form tool with a chamfer ground on the left side. With that runoff to depth, I can turn down the shoulder dimension 
before setting the ball tool. It is then just a simple matter of forming the ball down to quarter inch. And with that to size, I can touch off and move the parting tool to create the shoulder, taking care to remember that I enlarge the corresponding hole to one eighth earlier in the build. Severing the part with a saw, and it's done. Next up is the clamp, which is designed in three parts a nut, the clamp piece itself, and finally a screw. I'm going to start with a nut, which is a simple turning job to be a press fit into the 4.7mm hole in the sector finger. We can then swing the top slide over to cut a 45 degree chamfer to locate in a countersink, which will be cut into that same hole. The nut is then drilled and tapped M4, and reduced to final length before a chamfer and countersink finishes this side. Finally, I'm extending the work and dialing in the length using the top slide to part this off. Moving on to the screw, I'm setting the shoulder depth with a carriage stop and turning down to 4mm for the thread, before adding a small runoff groove and a couple of chamfers. Next is the dimension for the head, which should have been done before swapping out to the chamfer tool, but what can you do? I'm forming the thread under power using a die in the tailstock, starting with a die fully open and adjusting the size until I have a nice fit on an M4 nut. The length looks good as it is, so I can part this off to length, and after an honest five minutes of searching in the swarf tray, the part can then be put aside for slotting later. Finally for this assembly is the clamp disc itself. This is essentially a thick washer, which is turned to diameter with a 4.2mm through hole and an 11 30 seconds counterbore to fit over the nut body. The depth of this counterbore is fairly critical as it needs to completely accept the length of the nut but not break through the relatively thin clamp piece. With that done, the thickness can be dialed in, a generous chamfer added to what will become the top of the part, and a countersink formed. Before this is finally parted off, there are a couple of features that need to be added to it, so let's take it over to the mill. Here I have the part held in a collet block to help retain the orientation of the two features to be added. The first of which is a step to accept the second sector finger. Now this is dimensioned at 1 16th, but the material that was supplied measures up at 57 thou, so I'll machine it to that. The second feature is a 1 degree relief to allow the clamp to bear down on the finger. This angle is not critical, so I've simply used trig to calculate the necessary gap under one edge of the collet block, and selected a suitable feeler gauge to cock it over. Bluing the top allows me to adjust the depth to take a full cut off that surface. While we're at the mill, I'm taking the opportunity to cut the slot into the screw head. I have the screw mounted in an M4 hex standoff, and after touching off and moving down half the screw head plus half the saw thickness, the slot can be cut in one pass. There are no dimensions on the plans for this, so I dimensioned mine to fit a suitable screwdriver, which worked out to be 32 thou wide by 364 deep. With that complete, it's back to the lathe for the finishing touches. With the screw still in that hex standoff, adding a slight radius to the file finishes this part. Off camera, I have lightly deburred the clamp piece, so the only thing left to do here is to complete the parting process, and with that, the clamping arrangement is complete. The final operation at the lathe is forming a quarter inch radius in a scrap of brass using a ball nose end mill. This is to be used as a backer to help riveting the ball handles onto the sector fingers. With that done, it is over to the bench for some assembly work. The top sector arm needs a step forming in it to bring the finger down to the surface of the division plate. I briefly considered making a former for this, and then settled on bending it by hand in the vise like a savage. The bend points are marked on the material, and setting the finger squarish by eye, I'm pulling the first bend, before flipping the part and encouraging the second bend to start at the jaws with a softened length of brass. A couple of adjustments, and we have an acceptable result. Next, a shallow countersink is formed in the back of the fingers, and the shafts of the ball handles are peened into place. With the ball handles protected from the vice jaws, the backs can then be filed flat, and completely unnecessarily, I'm filling the remaining countersink with soft solder. Back over at the mill, a quarter inch countersink is formed 10 thou or so into the back of the remaining hole. This is to accept the 45 degree feature on the captive nut. And with that done, we can head over to the bench to see how it all looks. The sector fingers look okay, 
Off camera, I have pressed the nut into the sector arm and I have had to fettle the radius on this top arm to allow clearance from this clamp piece. Let's get this all together and take stock. Well, these are the parts I was looking forward to the least and I am reasonably satisfied with all of it. The fingers move nicely around the plate with no interference from the spring and the clamping arrangement works positively without undue force. In my haste, I have made the screw from mild steel, which is not ideal for a screw head. In the book, Thomas suggests case hardening, but I've never had great results with that. If the screw begins to wear unacceptably in the future, I'll remake it in silver steel and through harden it. As for the project as a whole, now I'm not saying that it's dragging on, but I am starting to see signs of corrosion on some of the parts. Having a project rust before I finished it is a new one on me, and I think it might be worth pointing out the reason behind it. All of the parts that you see surface rust on had been covered in layout fluid, which I usually clean off with acetone. Now this is fine, but it also removes all of the trace oil that usually protects uncoated steel in my workshop. Luckily this will all buff out with a fine steel wool, and I can add a thin layer of machine oil like I should have done in the first place. Anyway, I think I will call it a day for this video. Next time I need to make a start on the plunger assembly that will fit on here, so please do look out for that if you're interested. Again, do leave any thoughts in the comments. If you do want to see more like this, please do subscribe, and hopefully I'll see you again. Cheerio!